Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this IAPSI webinar organized by the South African group of IAPSI. My name is Pierre van der Spey, and I currently head up uh, the national group together with my colleague uh, Jan Wiem, who most of you will know in our APSI circles. Uh, we're trying to bring to an extent a bit of African flavor to, to these webinars. So we're trying to identify some signature projects on the continent um, and, and getting the speakers to share, uh, to share that with us. Uh, so today is our, our first webinar for the year, I believe. Uh, and then we also have some other ones planned that you can uh, look out for on the website. The next one is uh, the Ashton uh, Arch Bridge, which is a, a bridge here in the Western Cape uh, in South Africa, um, designed by ACOM. Uh, then the third we will have in, uh, in September, the Umaruru uh, Bridge Rehabilitation Project, which is in Namibia, uh, which is a bridge that had severe chloride damage. Uh, and then our last webinar for the year, we have planned on a 3D concrete printing. So look out for those on the IAPSI website. Then I just want to bring to your attention, uh, you may have seen that the next IAPSI conference is in Nanjing in China. And it is from the 21st to the 23rd of September this year. And the next one will be in Istanbul, between the 24th and the 26th of April uh, next year. Um, then just this, this presentation webinar is being telecasted and recorded, and it will be shared on uh, IAPSI's social media platforms uh, after, the, after the webinar. Uh, we will take questions during uh, the uh, webinar, but we'll, we'll deal with the questions um, at the end. But you can, if you want to ask a question, don't uh, type it in the chat, rather use the Q&A button um, at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we'll, we'll go through those um, at the end of the webinar. Uh, I'll shortly hand over to uh, Jan Wiem just to give us some background to IAPSI for, for those on the call that maybe aren't, aren't members yet. Uh, and then uh, Erasmus Rempling will also briefly introduce uh, technical or task group 1.7 uh, of IAPSI, which is uh, sustainability driven bridge engineering for early design phases. And it sort of ties in with today's webinar. Uh, IAPSI, uh, Jan will mention more about that, but made up of, amongst other things, various task groups. Uh, I believe there's about 20 or 30 or maybe even more task groups in our APSI that look at specific topics in structural engineering, the bridges, uh, buildings, even renewable energy structures, and um, some good conversations and collaboration, and uh, should result in, in research papers, journal papers, conference papers, and so on. So feel free to have a look at the tech class groups on IAPSI's uh, website and uh, join if you find some topic that might be interesting to you. Uh, it's not only open for academics, it's also um, anyone from industry can also join and, uh, and participate. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Jan Wiem to give us some background on IAPSI. Thank you, Pierre. Can you see my presentation in full screen mode? Yes. You do? All right. Uh, well, good day to everyone. And thank you to Pierre for, for this opportunity. I will, for those of you who are not familiar with IAPC, just give a brief overview. And then I will hand back uh, to Pierre again. Now, IAPC's mission is to exchange knowledge and advance the practice of structural engineering worldwide. And as you can see, um, the organization addresses aspects of structural engineering in all aspects 
from materials to construction processes design and also in terms of the participants in the construction process whether it's clients or consultants contractors academics researchers it's an organization that covers all of those one thing that uh, people often think uh, is that um, the organization focuses on on bridge engineering which is not the case uh, so please be assured that any type of structure is addressed in the organization and uh, there are also annual awards for all the different types of, of structures and you can see the numbers of members and the countries participating now the real core of the organization is the national groups from where uh, events are organized and uh, where people interact both with each other but also internationally from there on so I will say a few words more about the task groups as you see at the top there uh, Pierre introduced that but I'll say a few words um, nationally the national groups are responsible for arranging local events and those can be anything from a seminar to a webinar like we do now or even international conferences tours meetings site visits and everything so the aim of the national group is to keep IFC alive and to give opportunities for members both national and international to interact and I must say the real benefit of IFC for myself is the interaction with international uh, colleagues now you see there at the bottom a, a video which I'm not going to show that's maybe a little bit too long for the short overview but feel free to go and google why am I member of IFC and there's a four minute uh, video which you can go and watch there for me as I say the real benefit is the meeting of colleagues and sharing of information on an international platform and that really comes across when you start participating and attending uh, international events as um, Pierre mentioned the topic of task groups is a fairly new part of IAPC um, in the past we had technical committees uh, which for many years sat there and did not really make a contribution with task groups is very nice because task groups are output orientated they are put together for a period of two or maximum four years during which they need to present or publish or deliver something and if they don't they are disbonded um, so anybody can form a task group there must be at least one IAPC member but other members don't necessarily need to be IAPC members so if you're a researcher and you look for people to put together some research project you're welcome to form a task group uh, it can also be a group of people who would like to develop a, a design standard or a design code for example for concrete water retaining structures if you want to do something like that uh, the ideal thing would be a, a task group they are allocated to technical commissions who oversee them and will make sure that they find the right space and that they also deliver oops sorry one of the flagships of the organization is the the journal the structural engineering international which we also like to call the SEI uh, the SEI is published four times a year it's a high standard journal with which is peer-reviewed and uh, which contains articles on projects research projects materials structures anything uh, really the flagship of the organization other documents as you can see in the green there for example specialist items are covered by structural engineering documents and others in the form of bulletins and many of the task groups uh, outputs will in other words find their way into an IFC bulletin or a IFC document annually there are uh, symposia both uh, in the national groups but also international symposia you see the Prague one that was earlier on in the year there's often one uh, I absolutely like to talk about the spring conference and living in South Africa in the southern part of uh, the, the, the world we always ask her, whose spring are you talking about but normally in April or May there's a symposium and then there's the annual congress uh, towards the September of each year so this year as Pierre mentioned uh, the congress in nanjing please uh, look out for that if you haven't registered for that it's an ideal opportunity to to start participating and as i say the real benefit is when you maybe not the first year because you maybe still not uh, know all the people but as you go more and more 
you really start becoming part of the family of structural engineers worldwide who share the same ideas and same uh, visions that you may have. For young engineers, there's the Young Engineers Program in IAPC and student membership. Um, for students, only 20 Swiss francs a year. Often in various parts of the world, uh, universities allocate some funding for that to, to support the engineers, to, uh, young engineers to support that and to bring them into the family. So that is something that, that can be considered. But you see that you've got access to a variety of information as a young member and as a student member. This uh, webinar is recorded and there's a platform on the webinar, uh, on the web space, which uh, hosts e-learning information. Uh, past webinars are available there and as a member you've got access to that. Feel free to go and visit that page and see the type of information that is available there. Pierre, with that, I think that is my overview. Um, you mentioned the seminar, the webinars later on in the year, so I'm not going to repeat that and I'll just and back to you then by stop sharing of my screen. Thank you, Jan. Um, I'm going to hand over to Rasmus now to talk about uh, task group 1.7. So hopefully you see my screen now. Presenting and you can hear me as well. So uh, my name is Asmus Sampling. I come from Sweden. I'm a structure engineer in uh, one of the Scandinavian largest contractors, NCC. I'm also a professor in structure engineering at the uh, Chalmers University of Technology in the town Gothenburg. So uh, in 2019, we started this task group. So number seven task group in commission one so task group one seven and i said it's about sustainability driven bridge engineering for early design phases and um, as was mentioned here i also think that uh, the main benefit of being an EAPSA member is uh, all the great presentations and the information that are shared at uh, seminars and uh, conferences. I try to go at uh, each one of them and meet people and discuss different topics. And also uh, in this task group, we have tried to have um, task group meetings at the spring, you can call it spring um, symposiums. So what we do in this task group is that we look at the early design phases so um, and sustainability and we try to complement the nowadays well-known sustainable supply chain A1, A2, A3, A4, A5 as you can see on the right side um, and we do uh, discuss and uh, investigate um, upstream process um, aspects that um, uh, creates uh, possibility for sustainable solutions, but also uh, hinders uh, creativity uh, for sustainable solutions in the different uh, stages. We focus on both uh, transport infrastructure, such as bridges, uh, but also uh, buildings. Uh, we have completed, uh, we have six different parts since 2019 uh, when we started at the New York uh, conference. Um, and uh, the green ones here are already finished. And uh, typically, a task group after the reorganization in EAPS should be three to four years long. We are heading into the final stages now. But the first part that we did was AI support bridge tendering. Uh, the second part was roles and responsibility for sustainability in design and construction projects. Uh, third, uh, comparison between the use of the international fitting contract and Swedish contract praxis. Uh, fourth, that we finished uh, last year and presented uh, last year, how early is early in early contractor involvement? 
Uh, it's not only a funny title, it's, it's also a funny uh, project that we have. Uh, the two last parks that we are now finalizing this year is going through Triple Win, Paradoxes of Sustainability in the Construction Industry, and Design and Verification of Performance Requirements for Transport Infrastructure. And all this, except for going for the Triple Win, has been presented at uh, different um, generated conference papers uh, in uh, different uh, sessions. So this was a short introduction to uh, task group one seven and what we do. And um, I can really uh, support um, what was said before. Please join us at the uh, seminars and conferences. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rasmus. Um, so I will now hand over to our speaker for today. Um, our presenter is Maya Wilson from one of the bigger international companies in South Africa, SMEC, which some of you may know, or many of you may know. Um, she's a section manager in SMEC or sectional manager. And uh, she was involved in this beautiful project uh, here in Cape Town, uh, one of the more, I would say, iconic uh, projects that have taken place in Cape Town uh, over, the past, uh, over the past years. Uh, so Maya, I'll hand over to you and thank you very much for presenting. Thanks, Pam. So thank you very much, Pierre. Um, my name is Maya, as mentioned, and today I'm going to be speaking to you about the many inputs which are required to creating a single moving form. Many people who approach the new swing bridge at the VNA waterfront might be surprised to find out that it is in fact a moving bridge. The ground seems to rise and surround the bridge and there are a few clues that it can actually swing open at some speed and give shipping access to the docks of the Victoria and Alton Basin. Visitors see the attractive form of the bridge, but the complex design elements that allow for the bridge to move are unseen and almost unheard. And today I'm going to try to tell you the story of how the many inputs needed to design and construct the bridge were brought together to create a single moving form that we see today. Designers are always interested in the context in which their products will be used. All involved are inspired by the opportunity to design a footbridge within the VNA waterfront. It's South Africa's premier tourist destination and attracts millions of visitors from around the world each year. It combines retail, dining and leisure facilities around the historic Victorian Alfred docks with beautiful backgrounds of Table Mountain. Bridges and moving bridges within the VNA waterfront have become a memorable part of any visitor's experience. The new four meter wide swing bridge in fact replaced a smaller, much loved two meter wide swing bridge. The smaller swing bridge was built in 1997 and was a beautifully, beautiful, materially efficient structure that impressively opened and closed up to 60 times each day. However, with the further expansion of the waterfront, the number of people crossing the cut was increasing yearly. The previous two meter wide walkway, which once seemed appropriate, um, was by 2016 carrying 2.4 million people per year. So to keep pace with the demand, a new wider bridge was commissioned. Well-designed objects do what they need to do. And the design team first sought to find out exactly what the VNA wanted. They obviously needed a wider bridge with more capacity, but there were many ways of achieving that end. The initial stages of the project sought to question the VNA's commercial and operational staff about the expectations for the project. A systematic way to evaluate options was judged necessary, and the analytical hierarchy process was followed to create a tool for this purpose. The first step of the process was to determine a list of key preference criteria. Priorities were then established with the client by using paired comparison to weigh up various criteria against each other. The criteria put in a matrix format and each one evaluated against all others. Through this process, three key preference criteria stood out. These were functionality and reliability. The new bridge had to be equally efficient, effective and reliable as existing. 
The cost was fixed constraints and the bridge had to be built within a budget of $1.35 million and disruption to the visiting public, the v &A operations and the environment had to be limited. Although the new bridge had to double the pedestrian capacity across the channel, the client required that it should match its predecessor's speed of operation. This meant that it had to open in 90 seconds and close in 100 seconds. It was necessary that the bridge open the full width of the channel with infinite headroom for the reasons made obvious by the images. Furthermore, the bridge was required to be able to swing freely under ship impacts rather than try to resist it. The v &A waterfront was rightly concerned about the visitor's experience and the possible impact that the construction of the new bridge might have on their commercial operations. It was an imperative that the disruption caused by the construction works was minimized. This was such a fundamental issue that it was a major factor in deciding upon the new bridge's location and the construction method. The challenge became to find a bridge that could deliver the required functionality within the set budget. The decision on the most appropriate type of moving bridge was ultimately driven by cost. Both the capital cost and the predicted future routine maintenance costs were built up for a range of options. However, it quickly became apparent that the two viable options for the location were a swing bridge or a bascule bridge. Swing bridges are generally more efficient than bascule bridges because the power requirements to move the bridge are often driven by the need to counter wind forces. With swing bridges, power is needed to push the deck elevation through the wind. The lifted deck of a bascule presents a far larger area for the wind and more power is therefore needed to lift and hold the deck in place. After carefully evaluating various bridge options against the set of a criteria, it was decided that a swing bridge was best suited to the site and the context. To minimize disruption to the VNA and its visitors, it was critical that the existing bridge remain operational for as long as possible during the construction of the new bridge. In lieu of a bridge, a ferry service could be put to transport pedestrians across the channel. However, the cost of the ferry service was $20,000 in a month. And given this cost, the time between demolishing the existing bridge and installing the new bridge had to be limited. It was decided that the new bridge should be positioned adjacent to the original bridge allowing the foundations of the new bridge to be um, constructed whilst the original bridge remained operational. The nose of the new bridge, however, had to land at the same spot as the existing. Moving the nose closer to the historical clock tower was not feasible as it would have restricted the available space for crowds waiting to cross the bridge. A plan was therefore devised to create a temporary abutment for the existing bridge whilst the new bridge abutment was being built. The existing bridge was rotated 10 degrees short of its fully open position and docked onto a temporary locking nose. At the start of the preliminary design phase, two different types of swing bridge were considered and compared against each other in some detail. The first option was to replace the existing bridge with a wider version of itself. The existing bridge had, had a light through truss deck, a mast that rotated with the deck, a bearing at both the top and bottom of the mast, and stationary backstays. Usually the backstays on a cable stay bridge work in tension only. However, in this case, one of the stays had to resist compression forces as the deck rotated into the open to shipping position. The bridge was light enough to be supported on a pad footing. Uplift from the backstays was resisted by gravity anchors and the horizontal thrust was resisted by below ground struts connected to the mast foundations. The rotation of the original bridge was made possible by bespoke bearings at the top and bottom of the mast. However, for the wider version, it was decided that proprietary spherical bearings would be needed. Although the original bridge was small and light enough to be supported on pad footings, the wider version required piled foundations. The second option was to design a completely new swing bridge that used a conventional slewing bearing to rotate the bridge deck. Slewing bearings are tried and tested in both pedestrian bridge and industrial applications. Their large diameter allows them to resist overturning moments, and hence a cable stay bridge with no backstays could be conceived. This was attractive in that it limited the works that had to be done on the key side. It also allowed the bridge superstructure to be fabricated and assembled off-site, and then barged and lifted on, into place complete on a single day. The structural concept for the second option consisted of a 40 meter long cable stay bridge with a central spine beam. 
an upstand beam was needed to ensure that the deck surface level matched the key level as far as possible. The pylon would be a continuity of the main central beam and its stiffness would transfer the cable loads into the piled substructure. No backstays would be required. Um, and therefore a simple uncluttered structure could be created. A disadvantage of the wider version of the original bridge was that it was that the existing bridge would need to be decommissioned to build the new gravity anchors and backstays. The associated ferry costs therefore need, added a cost premium to this option. Its advantage was that it was structurally more efficient and therefore materially less expensive. It was found that the mechanical and foundation costs for the two options were comparable and overall the two options were similarly priced. The slewing bearing was found to have a marginally longer design life than the spherical bearings because any eccentric loading on the spherical bearings would likely accelerate the wear. Maintenance on the bearing at the top of the mast was considered to be inconvenient due to its height. The primary advantage of the slewing bearing um, was that it would cause less disruption during construction as the existing bridge could remain operational for longer. It also offered the opportunity to do something different. And for these reasons, it became the chosen option. After considering the functional aspects of making the bridge move, the design team took on the task of developing a final form that would add to the experience of the waterfront. Both architect and engineer had a strong idea to combine the pylon and spine beam into a single form, tension by the stairs. This basic idea is encapsulated in the sketch on the left. The design effect of the continuous sweeping line was created by running a continuous capping element along the length of the pylon and spine. The capping element was detailed to sit proud of the structure so that its lines could be easily followed. The recess created was used for the architectural lighting that would accentuate the continuous lines at night. The deck superstructure is cable stayed with a single plane of four 28 mil diameter locked coil cables connecting to a central upside spine beam. The spine beam is 500 mil wide and has a total depth of 800 mil. However, only 470 mil protrude above the top of the deck. The superstructure sits on the slewing bearing, which is stressed down onto a donut shaped pile cap by 34 vertical stress bars. The bridge is supported on eight piles positioned in a ring. The resultant load applied to the foundations is highly eccentric, with the pile group being designed for a maximum load eccentricity of 11.1 meters. The slewing bearing and hydraulic motors are located in a plant room created by the pile cap ring. By transforming the pile cap in this way, it was possible to house the mechanical works within the depth of the foundations, thus reducing the required excavation depth and keeping the foundations above sea level, which was advantageous from a durability perspective. Initially, there was some concern that the spine beam dividing the deck might limit pedestrians experience. It does, however, improve the flow of people crossing the bridge in different directions as it removes bi-directional conflicts. This in fact becomes important when platoons of pedestrians gather on either side of the cuts as the bridge opens and closes. The spine was also considered a playful element, a place to stop and sit. The unseen part of the bridge that allows it to move is the 3.55 meter diameter internally geared three row roller slew bearing. The bearing is driven by four hydraulic motors with a maximum output torque of 42 kilonewton meters each. Slewing bearings are designed to take an evenly distributed lo load around their full perimeter. However, in this application, the stiff spine mean connects the front and back of the slew, applying a concentrated load at the front and the back. Outrigger beams were therefore included to help distribute the load to the rest of the slew, but they were significantly less stiff than the spine beam and hence only transferred a small portion of the load. It was therefore necessary to model the supporting ring beam in a finite element model um, to ensure that the deflection of the ring beam did not induce unwanted stresses in the slew bearing. The mechanical works also included a nose locking pin installed at the end of the bridge deck. This pin engages with a socket in the abutment when the bridge is open to shipping and open to pedestrians. As the nose of the bridge approaches the abutment, it rolls up a steel ramp on wheels attached to the end of the deck. The deck levels were adjusted um, to ensure that the wheels always have positive bearing on the abutment ramp under normal loading conditions. 
The purpose of the pin was to ensure that the deck doesn't ever lift off the abutment during extreme thermal and wind loading conditions. The pin also fixes the nose in position transversely by resisting horizontal wind loading. The socket for the nose pin is fixed with two bolts and slotted holes, positioned so that they bear onto the base plate on one side only. Hence, only one bolt bears onto the base plate in either horizontal load direction. A single bolt and bearing is strong enough to resist wind loading, but will shear off under ship impact, allowing the bridge to swing freely. An important part of the detail design process was the development of a three-dimensional model in Revit of every detail of the bridge. This enabled the integration of electrical and mechanical works into the structure and the ability to graphically check the geometry and setting out of the bridge as it rotated. The model was placed in a cloud survey of the area that picked up every detail of the site, including service manholes, street furniture, and surrounding structures. This integrated model of bridge and survey allowed possible clashes to be identified and the setting out and levels of the bridge to be developed with a high level of confidence. As the user approaches the crossing, the ground rises to surround the bridge to give the comfortable impression that the structure is permanently seated into the key walls. Sliding gates open and close to allow um, and prevent pedestrian access to the bridge when required. Turnstiles are also provided for those caught in between. The stainless steel mesh on the balustrades was chosen to give the bridge an uncluttered and open feel. Two of the unique difficulties experienced by the contractor was the limited available space on site and their proximity to the public. Piling a meter away from pedestrians using a functioning moving bridge comes with challenges. Noise, vibration and debris therefore had to be closely monitored throughout the process. One of the key considerations during the piling operations was the stability of the key wall. The 19th century key is a stone packed wall positioned on the edge of a rock shelf. The fill material behind is mostly loose rock, sand and stones. The piling operations were carefully considered and monitored to ensure that the key wall would not be compromised during construction. The ODEX um, piling technique with pre-drilled and grouted pilot holes was chosen at this bridge site due to the ground conditions. The pilot holes were grouted up to improve the drill hole integrity to reduce the potential for the piling bit to become stuck within the loose fill material and to prevent blowing out of the key wall through the air pockets within the fill. Careful monitoring of both the physical and natural environment required during the piling operations. Sorry, just show a short video here. It's a bit loud. We had divers during the piling operations to check the key wall. This image also just illustrates how close the construction works were to the existing bridge, which was still in use. The seal superstructure was fabricated off site and then brought to the VNA waterfront in three pieces. Each piece was transported by road as all abnormal loads and assembled and welded together on a nearby jetty. A trial assembly at the fabrication yard ensured a good fit up on site. The deck was fully assembled on the jetty, complete with stair cables, handrails, and timber decking. The cables, however, could not be stressed until the deck was stressed down onto the foundations. Whilst the deck was being completed on the jetty, sorry, um, the adapter ring and slew bearings were installed. The adapter ring had to fit over the 34 holding down bolts, which were then stressed to 900 kilonewtons. The slew bearing was fixed to the adapter ring by means of 66 bolts. The slew bearing was epoxied onto the adapter ring to ensure that the required flatness specified by the manufacturer was achieved. On Tuesday, the 21st of May, 2019, the existing bridge was decommissioned and disassembly began. That Friday, the new bridge deck was loaded onto a barge parked adjacent to the jetty.
Early the next morning, the barge transported the debate deck to the site where it was then lifted and placed in position. For one month, the public were ferried across the channel whilst the cables were stressed, the deck level adjusted, the deck and handrail details completed, the pier head side abutment constructed, and the new barriers and gates installed. The new VNA waterfront swing bridge was officially opened to the public on the 11th of July 2019. The new four meter wide walkway has improved pedestrian flow, whilst the mechanical system is able to open and close the bridge at the same high speed as its predecessor. The bridge's integrated form is simple and unique. It's no more nor less than it needs to be, which gives it an elegance that is hoped will be timeless. There's also a happy ending for the original swing bridge, which was shipped to Mauritius, where it will continue its life at the Port Louis waterfront. Looking back, the story of the bridge for the design team was the collaborative effort needed to first create the design and then to build the structure. In this regard, moving bridges are a unique experience for a bridge engineer to interact and learn from other design professionals. Structural, mechanical, electrical, electronic and lighting engineers came together with architects and urban designers to integrate their experience. Structure and architecture are integrated into a single well-designed object rather than being one led onto the other. The mechanical and electrical elements became the unseen internal workings that give the design value as a functional object. The success came from all team members working towards a single design goal that met the client's functional requirements as well as their aspirations for a bespoke and attractive structure that would add to the VNA waterfront experience. And that's the end. Just uh, thank you very much, Maya. That was very interesting and, and very well prepared. Um, there aren't any questions yet on the on the question and answer board, but um, I'll maybe answer, I'll ask one. Uh, sure. The the role of the architect in in the final structural form. We, we in South Africa anyway, I mean, we don't get to deal with architects very often on, on bridge projects. So how, how did the architect at the end of the day contribute to, to the final form? Um, were you involved in that, in that aspect or not? Yes, for sure. We've worked with COA architects quite a lot um, on many of our bridges. Uh, they're a local Cape Town team and um, we work quite closely with them on a number of different sites and um, I think we worked with them in the from both the urban context uh, making sure that the design lines of the pedestrian flow was giving the pedestrian the client what it needed we we checked alternative routes and actually considered multiple bridges and and replacing or moving the bridge site completely. So we looked at, at both that idea. Then we also worked with them to get the, to create that single form. And then we also used them um, in, in some of the, the more finer details, you know, the look and feel of things like the handrails and the mesh and the detailing of the, of the walkway finishes. So we worked really closely with COA. Okay, yeah, that's very interesting. So it was an urban planning and architecture, basically, exercise. Um, I guess pedestrian bridges are the one place where you can still sort of play around a bit with, with aesthetics, uh, opposed to the normal concrete road bridges. <laughs> uh, are there any other uh, questions? I don't see any questions in the uh, Q&A. I just want to check if there are any here in the, in the chat. Uh, oh, yeah, was, yeah, is one. Uh, oh, interesting one. Um, the, do you know what the cost per square meter of the bridge is? 
Oh, golly. Um, let me get my calculator out. So uh, $1.35 million divided by 40 meters divided by a four. So let's times that by a million. So that's eight, eight and a half thousand US dollars per square meter. Wow. That is quite a lot in South African standards. It's obviously a moving bridge. Uh, moving yeah. bridge is going to cost more than a stationary bridge. Yeah, yeah. So, that, sorry, you said eight thousand so dollars. So uh, about hundred and about hundred and fifty thousand rand per per square meter. So that's yeah, sure. That's quite expensive. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Let me just double check my Christo, math. Uh, is saying that seems about. It seems about right, is one of the comments in the chat box. 125,000 randish, yeah. Okay, and uh, it's not, I guess, not typical that a client is prepared to pay that sort of money um, in South Africa for a structure like that. So it's quite Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of moving bridges. Um, moving bridges are mm. more expensive than stationary bridges. Um, uh, and obviously, you know, it's, a, it's only 40 meters long. Um, so I think it's yeah. square area is quite small. Um, yeah. and obviously, you know, it has to work as a cantilever. So it's, it's not a, yeah. it's not just a simply supported bridge. It is, uh, actually acting as, as a cantilever, obviously. Um, so it, it does need to take a lot of load. Ah, for sure. Um, then there's a question from Ciswe on what is the design life of the new structure? And can I add something to that? How was durability considered being a steel bridge in a, in a very corrosive environment? Yeah, so the design life is 100 years um, as a standard. The durability was obviously highly considered. Uh, the steel work is galvanized and painted with a very robust paint specification. Uh, we've got some stainless steel elements uh, because of the sea. And also, I did mention, but we try to keep, for example, the mechanical equipment out of the sea zone. Um, and, you know, that would also help because obviously the water actually just goes into that key wall as the tide goes up and down. So it is very mm -hmm. close to the ocean and uh, we did have to give it a very robust durability spec. Yeah. And the, the slew bearing, does that have a specific finite lifespan? Yes, um, it is supposed to last 50 years, but we have also, during the construction, there is a slab to the side, um, which will allow removal of the existing slew bearing and replacements. Okay. Okay, that's interesting. And then there's another question from Christian who asks also what is the design life so that's been answered and the question is then how does maintenance uh, to the bridge is that an issue and does it access or affect access to the dry dock um, is there a maintenance schedule or, or is it just sort of left to, to, to stay no there of course and, there is yeah. a there's a very good maintenance schedule um most of the maintenance is for the mechanical equipment rather than the structure. Um, mm. The mechanical equipment requires a lot of maintenance. Fortunately, the client has um, a very strong engineering team. Uh, the previous bridge also required a lot of maintenance and, and the v has got lots of um, mechanical equipment that requires maintenance. So they've got a very good team on board. The mechanical engineer, Eden Consulting, put together a very good maintenance manual for the for the clients, and that is followed. Um, as I said, the, the steelwork, the structure, should I say, doesn't require nearly so much routine maintenance, but all the usual, um, you know, there's there's surfacing on the timber. Um, so there's we did put some protection onto the timber, but that requires maintenance, you know, every kind of five to ten years. The steel work requires checking maybe every 20 to 25 years. Well, um, painting is anticipated to be required that often, but obviously it's in the, it's in the client's eye and they are uh, inspecting it regularly, which is great. Okay, that's, 
That's interesting. Uh, I've got another question, and that is the physical rotation of of the deck. Does that does that apply any forces to the to the bridge itself, or does that movement is it slow enough that um, that's sort of that dynamic effect doesn't really play a role? It, it's it's slow enough, yeah. I mean, there is obviously a slight um, load as it rolls up the bearing, um, up the up the little rail. However, yes. this is much less than like a wind load or a, what it was designed for. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now I can just imagine dynamics must have been quite a, a big consideration in generally in in the design. So the previous bridge, I'm not sure if you ever had the opportunity to go over it, was a little bit bouncy. Yeah. So the client was quite conscious of, of pedestrian um, dynamics. And that was obviously something that we had to check uh, and make sure that this one wouldn't, wouldn't be so, so lively. But it, it's a much bigger and you know, heavier bridge. So it, we don't have any of those issues on this one, which is great. Okay. All right. Um, there aren't any other questions on the box, but um, just maybe a remark from my side. Um, you all saw some beautiful pictures of Cape Town, so please, uh, please come and visit us. Uh, <laughs> it's a wonderful place to visit. Um, thank you, uh, thank you very much, Maya. It's just very interesting and informative. Um, if there, if there aren't any other questions, uh, we can then close this webinar. Okay. Thanks, yeah. I, I don't see any others. So thanks very much, Maya. And, and thank you everyone for, for attending and have a good weekend. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.